In the 70s, you did some work with Tim Wilson about uh, judgments about ourselves. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Well, um, the judgments that we were concerned with was people's ability to say why they had done something or why they thought something. Um, I got into it because I was doing an experiment where I thought if you could persuade people who were about to take be, to go through some intense emotional experience, which we achieved by giving them electric shock, uh, which is always accompanied not only just by the, the painful sensations, but arousal. And the more aroused you are, the more aversive this whole thing is. But we said if we could give people a pill and tell them that that pill was going to make them, their heart rate would increase, their breathing would become irregular, their palms might become a little sweaty. In other words, the symptoms of arousal physiological arousal that you get under strong emotion, here's the pill that's going to cause those things, that those people would find the shock less aversive uh, because they're going to, the, the arousal, instead of multiplying the sensations, is attributed to something else. It turns out that's true. It's actually dramatically true. Um, but in those days, you had to be able to ask your subjects what was going on in their heads to have support for your theory. So I would say, gee, I noticed you took an awful lot of shock. Why is that? And the guy might say, well, you know, I used to put work with uh, radios when I got shocks from time to time. I say, well, I'm sure that could have played a role. Um, tell me, did you make any connection between what was going on and the pill you took? Oh, no, no. I didn't. Um, did you uh, think about the, the pill or that the fact it was going to cause it? No, I didn't think about it at all. So then we tell them the theory about why they might have taken so much shock. They say, well, you know, it's very interesting. It could well be true for somebody. But um, see, I used to work with radios and get shocks and so on. So um, it was clear they had absolutely no clue about the cognitive process that was going on for them. Um, so I began to think, well, you know, there's a, there's a lot of things like that where I think there are things going on with me. I later find out that's not what I was thinking at all, or that's not why I did that. Uh, so Tim Wilson and I just started a series of studies uh, to see how well people could identify what was going on in their heads. So very simple kinds of things like we would have people uh, look at uh, nightgowns or nylon stockings, four of them in a row, and evaluate them. We found out something that should be interesting to merchandisers, which is the later you view something, the, more, the higher your evaluation of it. I have no idea why that is. I mean, introspection tells me nothing. Yep. <laughs> uh, nobody's introspection, but, but it's just a fact. So you ask people to do this, and then you say, well, why did you like this one the best? And they give you, oh, well, the color is better, the, the feel, they're all identical, by the way, yep. uh, and, uh, except that they look slightly different. Um, and you say, okay, well, that's, that's very interesting. Thank you very much. Oh, just one question. Um, do you think that the order in which you looked at those things had an effect on you? And people, they get a little, they're a little frightened. I mean, either I didn't understand the question or I'm dealing with a madman. Uh, so, um, or a simple study where we, uh, study number one, we're going to ask you to learn word pairs like dog rabbit, um, uh, ocean moon, People memorize 20 pairs like that. Thank you. Now we're going to do another experiment. Uh, we're just going to ask you to free associate uh, when I ask you a question. I'm going to ask you, and then we give some examples of the questions we'll ask, and they say the first thing that comes into their mind. So one of the things we might say is, um, uh, name a detergent. Uh, and the guy says, probably, Tide. Fine. So after it's all over, we say, why, I wonder why you, why did that come into your mind? I said, well, uh, I like the box, it's a colorful box, uh, or that's what my mom uses at home. And then you say, well, I don't know if you remember, you, you memorized the word pair ocean moon. Do you think that could, well, no, I just, so, <clears throat> and we know, because we got control subjects, experimental subjects, we know that we've doubled or tripled the likelihood that they'll give this association. Um, so this is the kind of thing we did. And we did, um, ba basically, <laughs> uh, everything we tried worked in the sense that people didn't 
give us a pro correct explanation and sort of consistent with our subject's behavior, we were wrong half the time about what would be going on in their heads or what effect we would get. Mm -hmm. So our introspections were nearly useless, mm -hmm. which puts us together with our <laughs> subjects in terms of having problems figuring out what's going on in our heads. Uh, what sort of research has been done since then? Uh, well, the, some of the most wonderful, Wilson has continued to do this research and he's done fabulous things. Um, he asks people to evaluate art objects or uh, records uh, and, uh, and then uh, say how much they like each of them or uh, he asks how much you liked it and then why did you like it? Uh, so it could be jams, preserves. You say, well, it's got this fruity, kind of tangy taste and I like the color and so on. People who do that, people who explain why they like this thing, uh, do a worse job of predicting how much they're going to like it down the road. Uh, so, than people who just evaluate it. Um, so, uh, the reason that he says this is going on is that if you ask to ex if you're asked to explain why you like something, you're going to focus on just those things that are verbalizable by definition. So you're going to miss all the rest of it. That doesn't get so you you say why you like it based on the things you can articulate. All of the other reasons you might like or dislike go by the wayside. So later when you look at how much they like the art object or the, the jams or whatever, uh, they, they do, their correlation between how much they liked it initially and how much they liked it later goes to heck when you have asked them to explain why they did that. So, so it seems then that we might not be much better at at predicting or interpreting our own behavior than anybody else's. Is right. that true? Uh, I mean, don't we have some sort of privileged access to, to our own, own beliefs? And well, I know what I was thinking, and you may not know what I was thinking, so I've got an advantage there. Um, but it's amazing how ignorant we are of things that are really important to us, and how much we insist that we know why these things happened or, or would happen. My favorite study in this whole line of work was done with uh, Harvard women. Uh, they were asked uh, for a period of a month, maybe more, uh, to at the end of each day say, how, how good was your day? I mean, how happy were you? How satisfied with it were you? And then they answered a number of other questions for, what, for, to evaluate what went on during the day, or just report uh, what day of the week was it, uh, uh, how was their sex life uh, that day, how did the work go, uh, how much sleep did you get, uh, etc. Uh, and you now at the end of all of this you can see how much these things actually affected their mood. And you ask people, oh by the way, we'd just be interested in knowing how much you think each of these things influenced your mood in general. There was no correlation whatsoever between the actual impact of these things on people's mood and people's reports about the mood. And if instead of saying, what, how much did these things affect you, you would say, let's take a hypothetical person, Jane. Tell me how you think uh, each of these things would affect you. Well, she gives the same answer that she would have given for herself. She's no more right about Jane than she is about herself. Uh, so, but. We, you know, we have a conviction that we know things like, I mean, you're telling me I don't know what makes me happy or unhappy? I mean, give me a break. Uh, sorry, can't give you a break. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Does happiness fall into the same category? Do we know what makes us happy? Well, I think the study with these Harvard women say that a lot of the time we don't. Now, of course, I know that if my kid gets a great report on his report card, I know that makes me happy. It does make me happy. Uh, well, on the other hand, these are not trivial things. Everybody thinks they've got a blue Monday. Actually, it's not really true. <laughs> uh, everybody thinks that, um, uh, that, that a variety of things that have a big impact on them don't really. Um, and Wilson has also shown that people are terrible about predicting what kinds of effects on things in life. So you've got people who are um, 
college students who are dating, uh, and you ask them, what do you think, how, how, what would it do to you if this were to break up? You know, miserable, I wouldn't be able to hold my head up, I couldn't sleep, and so on. Actually, uh, that's not true. Uh, or the, the, the unpleasantness only lasts for a small amount of time. Or you ask people who are just coming who are, uh, into a university, freshmen, uh, what if you got dorm X? What do you think it would mean to you? So, oh my God, that's, that's terrible. It's, it's dark, it's gloomy, the people there are boring, it would wreck my life. And actually, there's no, they're no less happy. Even uh, everybody assumes they'd be thrilled and delighted forever if they won the lottery. That only lasts for a few weeks, and actually, lottery winners end up being less happy than they were before. I mean, uh, I mean, their neighbors are begging them for money, etc. Um, the flip is true as well. I think it happens for death. Uh, one's own. <laughs> <laughs> no, right. That would be interesting. <laughs> but it, it, death doesn't. Bereavement is. Uh, doesn't last as long, or it's right. not as bad as, right. as we, we think bereavement it predict would be. Bereavement doesn't. But if you ask people, what do you think it would do to you to become paraplegic, couldn't move your leg, people take it for granted that would wreck their lives. And of course, it's terrible for a while, but eventually, I mean, they're never as happy as they were before or as the average person, but the misery does not last. And they find pleasure in things that we don't. <laughs> they say, I, I enjoyed brushing my teeth today. So, I mean, they, there's a... Uh, Wilson and Dan Gilbert, uh, his colleague, um, have a notion that we don't understand how good our psychological immune system is. That is, ways we have of lifting ourselves up, and we don't know what the hell is going on. Dissonance reduction is one. You know, uh, somebody moves from the Midwest to California, but it's a different job, and he has to go to a small house, and so on. How do I? He's going to lose some things. But he reduces dissonance by saying, you know, who wants to take care of a big house like I had in the Midwest? And the weather here just covers a multitude of sins and so on. So we're very good at uh, rationalizing, explaining away, at making things uh, better uh, than, uh, than, than we think we could. So, and they have a concept of immune neglect. We don't understand that about ourselves. We don't understand, understand that we will adapt. So. This course is about the science of everyday thinking. What advice do you have for people who want to think better and do better? Well, uh, we know a fair amount about that now. Uh, a little background about this. I uh, started working, you spoke on a note to Danny Kahneman, um, and I was doing work very much like his, showing that uh, people make all kinds of errors because they can't think statistically. They make all kinds of errors because they don't understand the need for a control group in something. I mean, 28 people took a weight loss program and nearly all of them lost weight. So, well, what was the control group for that? I tend not to understand that kind of concept. Um, and, uh, and they're really pretty dramatic errors that people make in everyday life. Uh, and at the time, pedagogical theory said, uh, you can't teach people rules of inference. I mean, it's something as broad as that. I mean, you just have to teach them some facts and some procedures. And you can't give them broad principles that will affect uh, their lives in a, in a very substantial way. Um, and I accepted that view. And also, it was clear to me that I was making the same kinds of mistakes that my subjects were. I mean, I had a little bit of an advantage because uh, I had some data about what was going on. Uh, so basically, I was, <laughs> my attitude, you know, we're dumb and nothing can be done about it. So I decided I was going to show that nothing can be done. You can teach people these principles and nothing happens. And I, fortunately, I couldn't have been more wrong. You can teach people principles, I mean, tremendously important principles like uh, the law of large numbers in such a way that, and you can do it in a matter of minutes, and you can affect how they'll reason about absolutely all kinds of things. Um, my favorite example is some uh, economic principles, personal microeconomics, um, that concepts that people don't have, uh, and they should have, uh, and it will, they'll live different lives if they understand that, uh, if they understand these concepts. Uh, 
my favorite is the concept of sunk cost. Um, people don't understand that if they've paid for something, they should consume it only if it's still pleasurable. Because actually, they can't get that money back. I mean, well, sometimes you can't, but I mean, if you buy a ticket to, to a game and you don't go, you're, you can't get that money back. So they feel like the economical thing to do is to, you know, darn it, go ahead and watch this thing. Um, and, um, but you can give them, just a couple of anecdotes will change people's behavior, make them understand this concept. Um, so suppose you had uh, tickets for the basketball game in Detroit, which you bought a month ago, uh, but it turns out the star's not playing, it's not going to be that interesting a game, it started to snow, uh, and uh, it's a, an hour drive. Uh, should you, you, you think you should go to the game? You say, well, yeah, I can't waste that money. Uh, and an economist would say, well, wait a minute, um, let's try the following thought experiment. Suppose you hadn't bought tickets to the game, uh, and a friend called you up and said, I have tickets to the basketball game in Detroit tonight. Would you like to have them? If your answer would be, yeah, sure, you know, I'll go. I like to watch basketball whenever I can. But by all means, go. But if your answer is, you've got to be kidding. It's snowing. The star isn't playing. You should not go to that game. In other words, just a few anecdotes like that, and people will apply that. We know they'll apply it. We call them up weeks later. They know where they were in a psychology study. Weeks later, we call them up in the guise of a, a survey being done by a national company and ask them to think about problems. And now they will apply the sunk cost principle to those problems. Same thing is true for opportunity cost, where the basic idea is anything you do, you're paying an opportunity cost for. That is to say, you could have been doing this or that or the other thing. So uh, you need to assess, do I want to pay that cost or do I want to go do, do this other thing? Uh, and that changes people's understanding of things, changes their thinking. So statistical concepts, methodological concepts, um, find that some undergraduate courses really change people mm -hmm. uh, dramatically. They really do understand some social phenomena better if they've had social science courses. Um, and um, two years of graduate school in psychology teaches you to use the scientific method for all kinds of everyday life problems uh, it, uh, and statistical uh, inference and all kinds of problems that come up in everyday life. And it's turns out the people who are learning most among the psychologists, in fact, the only ones who are learning, are those who are in the so-called soft areas of psychology. Um, personality psychology, social, developmental, the rat people, the brain people gain very little. They're taking the same statistics courses, but they're not learning how to apply it outside. And if, you, if you're doing research on people, you have to think about how to apply these concepts to people's behavior. So you learn how to code behavior in such a way that, uh, that you can make contact with these principles. Um, people think statistically already pretty well about lots of kinds of things. I mean, abilities, they're pretty good at because, especially if there's something countable there. And they understand, for example, the law of large numbers for abilities. I mean, um, and... Uh, like there's an expression in, uh, in this country that uh, on any given Sunday, any team in the National Football League can beat any other team in the National Football League. That shows a comprehension of the law of large numbers. They said, so, but they know perfectly well that over the long haul, the class will tell. And we understand that for all kinds of abilities. People don't understand it for personality traits. I mean, how can I compare the friendliness of Joe with the friendliness of Jane? I mean, is, what's the units here? Is it, uh, is it smiles per minute? Uh, is, it, is it pleasantries, you know, number of pleasantries all together? I mean, there's no way to make the comparison. So, but if you understand some aspects of, of coding and and you can, you can appreciate the fact that any sample you get of someone 
is a small, Benny Kahneman has a wonderful idea about you meet someone and our conception of what's going on is that you're sort of getting a, a, a hologram, a small hologram, a little fuzzy and a little, but basically I, I'm getting a read on you, it's, I'm, getting, uh, I'm getting what's there. Um, and in fact, it should be thought of as a sample of a huge population. Um, I don't realize meeting you. I have really no conception of the fact that you can be, behave in totally different ways in a huge range of situations. I just don't see that. Which is kind of odd because I see it for myself. I know lots of people think I'm a jerk. Lots of people think I'm a really swell guy. I know lots of people think I'm very smart. A lot of people think I'm an idiot. I mean, uh, they're all right. <laughs> it's just, you know, you see them in one small slice of behavior and you don't, you don't recognize that. One thing that, that psychologists have discovered, and Tim Wilson and I were some of the first to work on this kind of question, is how much that goes on in our heads is unconscious. I mean, we, we think we know what's going on. I mean, it's just, uh, I mean, Freud didn't know the half of it. <laughs> I mean, m most of what goes on in our heads we have very little inkling of. Some of the work that's come out recently about um, um, these priming effects, trivial little things, embarrassing that we're affected by them. I mean, uh, you ask me to read a persuasive communication and you happen to have introduced a fishy smell into the room, I'm not as persuaded hmm. by it. Something's fishy here. <laughs> literally. Yeah, Interesting. Literally. Yeah. It, it works, and we know that that's what's going on. It's the fishy thing, the metaphor, because there are some countries that don't have the metaphor that I'm something, I'm, there's, there's something fishy yeah, so about that. That's this. your control group, is it? So they don't that's have right. experience. That's right. There are some cultures that just don't have that. I mean, okay. in, in Denmark, so, I think it's I smell a rat. So. Ah, I gotcha. I, how, who knows what a rat smells <laughs> like? <laughs> I don't know if there's rat essence that you can spray into the air. So then what's the upshot? So you're saying, so yep, so a lot of it's unconscious. Yeah, um, a lot of, I mean, process, in terms of my definition, is always unconscious. There's no such thing as awareness of cognitive process. We claim it, but we don't claim that we have awareness of the, of the perceptual processes that we have. We have absolutely no idea how these various sensations are getting treated and, and uh, when you teach it in psychology what perception is like virtually everything you tell people they had no idea I mean a lot of I mean there are a million visual illusions for example which depend on the fact that we have certain perceptual processes that operate in a particular way and if you give us something that's slightly off base from that we make an error in it because the, the, the unconscious perceive, procedures that we have for perceiving the world uh, will lead us astray in those situations. Um, so anyway, that's... So how could, so oh, when, are we, are we uh, on now? Oh yeah, well... <laughs> <laughs> I, I, don't, uh, we, I don't know whether to stop and let you take yeah, us yeah, in another direction. This, this, is, this is one that we probably won't make the interview, but it is, yeah, it's a selfish question. So, mm -hmm. so precisely then, I mean, there are, there are so many things we can do. One of them is we're trying to make ridiculously high production values for these things and, and, and maintain attention. Another thing we're trying to do is make a check on fluency. So it might look good and feel good, but here's some assessment to see whether you actually know this to, to try and boost self-assessment and, and awareness. But mm. you no, know, those are things from the literature we're trying to do, but are there, are there any specific things you think that we could, we could do um, There's, to help in, us teach this? In my whole book, the thing I most want people to understand is that we, we solve problems. Everything from the most common everyday problem, like how do I make up my, to Joe after my unpleasantness to him, to how do I solve this professional problem that I'm dealing with, that most of that goes on. First of all, there's no access to process at all. We know what's in our heads. Some of it, huge amounts, we don't know what's in our head. And the, the procedures that we use to solve problems um, are, uh, are often completely uh, opaque to us. We, don't, we just we don't know how we did it. 
My favorite study like this that was ever done uh, was uh, in the 1930s. Um, a psychologist whose name was NRF Meyer uh, had people uh, do a, a problem, solve a problem. He had cords hanging from the ceiling in different places. Um, and he said, I want you to bring these cords together. And, and there were lots of things that were, there were, very, there were things lying all around the room. And so people see something that they could use an extinction cord. So they tied the extinction cord to one of them, pulled it to the other, easy solution. Uh, and after they had five or six of these, then uh, he, there was one other way to do it that they hadn't yet discovered, which was much more difficult. And they, after this, the subject had been stumped for five or 10 minutes, uh, Meyer, who's been wandering around the room the whole time, flips one of the, uh, the cords, sets it into motion. Within 45 seconds, the typical subject tied something to the bottom of it, swung it like a pendulum, grabbed the other, and tied them together. And Meyer says, that's great, that's the solution. How'd you come up with that? And no one ever gave him the answer, uh, and uh, the correct answer. And he ran some psychologists through this, and they were hilarious. I mean, in their rich accounts of what I thought of monkeys swing, swinging through trees. The idea of a pendulum entered my head at the precise moment. <laughs> so, uh, but that's just for ordinary, everyday problems of the most mundane kind. If you read, uh, there was a, a couple of years ago, there, um, the main journal in mathematics uh, received a paper from an obscure mathematician at some small university somewhere who, whose previous job, he couldn't get a job even, was working at a subway. They get a, a paper from him, uh, which is a, a, a partial solution to the question, can you prove that there are an infinite number of twin primes? Mm -hmm. Three and five are twins, seven and... No, no. That is seven and five. I, I run out. Okay, this is not my yeah. strong suit. Uh, but anyway, mathematicians for centuries have worked on this problem. So here is this. He gives this solution to them. The math journals get papers on mathematics from quacks and yeah. and all the time. But this seemed a little plausible, so they sent it out to a bunch of prominent reviewers. And with <laughs> the reviewers came all the way, my God, this is right, this is, this is a correct solution. They published the thing by warp speed, by academic standards. Uh, and then somebody asked him, tell me, how did you solve this problem? He said, well, I've been working on it for years. And I was sitting in somebody's backyard in Colorado at a barbecue, and suddenly the idea about how it was popped into my head. I'd been thinking about what I was about to eat. There's a million stories like this by mathematicians. Uh, I wasn't even thinking about it. The thing popped into my head. Um, you're working on, you're, you have a slave who's working for you all the time. Uh, that's your unconscious. And we don't take nearly as much use of it as we could. You have to, there's a, a, a writer for the New Yorker who has a wonderful um, account of how, how you how you write, how to do it. So you have to sit down and think a bit about what you're going to do. If you, if you don't, nothing's going to happen. The next time you sit down, there's been, but if you, if you actually do that, spend a few minutes thinking about what the problem is, how, how you want to get this thing across. It's been handed over to the unconscious, and the unconscious is working on it 24 hours a day, no matter what you're doing. Um, I mean, I find that with my own work all the time. I, when I'm teaching seminar, I give thought questions. If I wait until I, just before I have to do those thought questions, it's a, an effort, they're not very good. If three or four days in advance, I said, what are the best things that I want to make sure come out of the discussion here? Uh, and just spend five or 10 minutes on it. Three days later when I start to do it, it's like I'm taking it by dictation and they're much better than I would otherwise have come up with. I don't know that I've ever convinced any students. For that term paper, first day of class, tomorrow start working on that term paper. Yeah. And I don't think they believe me. I, mean, <laughs> I don't know that I've ever gotten across, but I, uh, 
I, do, I have a lot of examples now of this kind of thing. And I think if you spent 20 or 30 minutes with people, they might really come to believe you and might be able to make much more use of their brain than they are. My name is Richard. I think about inference.